when you get chronically stressed out, so somebody who isn't sleeping well, has a lot of strain in their life, maybe is over-exercising, whatever it is, is too strained and doesn't have enough recovery, what you'll see is that the body will favor sympathetic activity. So what that means is your body, as with anything, practice makes perfect. So if you practice being stressed out and not recovered, your body will remember how to do that well. <laughs> I'm Catherine Fantasi. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Apollo Neuroscience. On today's episode of Ever Forward Radio, I talk about stress, resiliency, heart rate variability, and everything you need to know about your nervous system and what to do to keep it well-balanced and recovered so that you can accomplish everything you set your mind to. Catherine, welcome to Ever Forward Radio. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. We're going to dive into an area that has really helped my overall well-being, my physical state, my mental state, my emotional state over the last couple of years. And that's becoming more aware of my stress, my stressors, how I can manage it, how I can measure it in both quantitative and qualitative measurements. Um, but first and foremost, I want to get going with just a question of definition, really. I'm curious to get your interpretation of stress. Here we are, 2022. How do you define stress? And maybe what is a way that we are not thinking of stress in the way that they should? Okay. Well, stress is life. Life is stress. If there wasn't Simply stress, put. <laughs> right? Like if there were not any stress, you'd, I mean, you're what would life be, right? I think the main thing is the difference between you stress and distress. So you stress is good stress. So think about taking a run, mm. right? Going on a run, swimming, any of those things are stressors and they strain your body, but then you, as long as you have enough recovery from them, they help make you stronger. They build you up, same strength training, mm. anything like that. And also cognitive stuff like learning. Learning is hard right? It takes a lot of cognitive units to learn, right? Public speaking, all these kinds of things, but they stretch you and then you recover. And as a result, you grow. So that's good stress. This stress is when the stress is straining you and it causes damage, right? And there isn't a recovery period. And so I think the main thing to think about, especially in light of the pandemic lockdowns and the massive change that that has, caused for us as a society and that still even in this kind of post covid mm. but still kind of covid situation that we're in because of all the things that have happened to the economy and all the changes that have happened to our lives um i think you know people's perception of stress has changed um people's awareness right. of stress has changed um and so it's really about managing the balance right? It's making sure that there's enough recovery in your life that you are able to cope and be resilient to stress. Um, and so stress is good as long as you have time to recover from it. And we're definitely going to dive into the recovery aspect, but you bring up a really good point. Perception or awareness. Do mm -hmm. you think we're in one more than the other right now? Is our perception of stress, is it new? Has it changed? Or are we just in a different form of awareness of it, of stress that has been there pre-pandemic, uh, but maybe now due to a lot of free time on our hands or just time at home, we've had a little bit more of a magnifying lens or a microscope. You know, you take your pick of, wow, this is stress. This is what it feels like. This is what it looks like. And this is really where it's been. And I just haven't been paying attention. Is it perception or awareness? I think it's both, right? So I think... Uh, stress did get worse, right? Because all of the underpinnings that people could rely on, uh, and this didn't happen to everybody. There's a lot of fortunate people that this didn't happen to, but for a lot of people, a lot of your safety net disappeared, right? Like childcare, mm. right? All of a sudden you're taking care of your kids and you're homeschooling your kids and you are in a very small house that's now a classroom and your office and your bedroom, right? And where you, and you're not leaving. And for a lot of people, you know, work from home, a lot of people didn't go back to the office, not completely, right? And there were a lot of ups and downs with where, you know, kids in school, kids back from school, quarantine, all these things happened. And 
it changed a lot of people's lives. Some people lost their jobs, their careers changed. Everything about their existence was dramatically changed in a matter of weeks, and it went on for a very long time. And for a lot of people, we're, they're still transitioning out of it, right? It's this kind of like weird limbo place. Um, and you're seeing it, right? And, you know, gas prices, you see it with the airports, travel. It's mm-hmm. like still not back to normal. Yeah. Like we're not, we're, we're not there. And so I think amount of stress, it's not just perception, right? Like it, it actually got worse. And, uh, and I think as a result, people had to adapt really quickly um, to a whole confluence of changes. And a lot of people didn't have a safety net. And that's just something to be aware of. Um, I think, though, in the coming out of COVID, um, the awareness of stress has changed, right? Because I think a lot of people had this concept of like rise and grind, right? We're just going to get up at the 4 a.m. club and I'm just going to get up and I'm just going to keep pressing and I don't need to sleep. And then when you show up like that and you real and you have more stressors than normal, your resiliency is down and you actually can't bounce back and you actually can't perform and you start to see what happens to your health and your well-being and your overall capacity to grow and learn and be this, you know, strong person, the strong, resilient go-getter. It's way harder to do if you don't have the reserves. And so I think as a result of how much people had to deal with upheaval, it gave them a new lens to look at their lives. And you're like, maybe this rise and grind actually isn't serving me. Maybe I should actually be focusing on my recovery. Maybe I should actually be really thinking about my sleep, right? And what that means for my overall health, because I think this has given people an opportunity to look at how much recovery and how much focusing on actually making sure there's enough time to bounce back and to be allows you to actually be more resilient in the face of stress and actually grow Mm -hmm. and continue to actually be able to improve. Whereas otherwise people are just burning themselves out. And I think that became more clear. Yeah. Uh, You really kind of preaching to the choir here and I'm just nodding my head and that was me. That was me. I've talked about before of how I, I chose to adopt that mentality for a little while. And I think a lot of us do and did of, I'm going to wake up earlier. I'm going to work harder and I'm just going to accept and make these sacrifices and the sacrifice being ourself, our health, mm-hmm. our wellness, our sleep. Um, but I can tell you that didn't last long. Uh, I, I definitely chose to look at things differently and that's where I want to go next. Actually speaking of looking at things differently to kind of piggyback off of this aspect of awareness and perception, because that's what, that's what I like to do here on the show. And that's what Everford is all about is, you know, it's this mindset shift really in any area of our life, our wellness. So as we have become more aware of stress in our life, can we change our perception of that stress, of this distress so that it can maybe become a you stress? My real question here is, is the level to which stress is going to affect us negatively or positively Can it just be in our mind if we change our perspective on what this stress is, how we're going to go about it? Can we actually flip it on its head? So sure. Mindset is a big part of it. Right. So but that isn't all of it. Right. So there's actually um, something called the perceived stress score, the PSS. Mm. And that's because you and I could have the same stressor happen to us, but your perception of it could be different than mine. And part of that is mindset, but also it's what we're coming to the table with, Mm -hmm, right? mm So I think the best way to, like a very simple analogy is if uh, we're both driving and we get cut off by some, somebody who's in a rush and they like cut us off and they nearly cause an accident. And maybe I got a full nine hours and I'm very recovered, I react to it. I'm like, wow, that guy's having a bad day. But maybe you got six hours of sleep and you're exhausted and your kids are screaming in the back of the car. You are way more likely to react, right? Maybe that's road rage. Maybe that's just like getting distracted. Maybe whatever happens, but it's how much resiliency we have when we come to the table. So part of it is taking a look at what is the stressor and how do we perceive it? If you look at it from a negative lens, like, oh, 
the stressor, this is going to get me, I can't do this. And you negative self-talk, like you're setting yourself up for failure, (laughs) but it's way harder to have positive thinking and to be able to frame things in a positive light if you aren't recovered, right? So you have to look at your chronic stress level and what you're doing to support your recovery of your nervous system in order to be able to make sure that you have the capacity to be able to do that top-down control. That cognitive control requires rest, recovery, and just being in a state of balance and capacity. Mm -hmm. And, And I know one of the ways that we can tap into understanding and get a measurement of where our stress levels are through this little thing called HRV, heart rate variability. And mm-hmm. it's something that, you know, I, I use a whoop here and, you know, I've been looking at a lot of different wearables over the years and ways to, to, to measure it so that I can help manage it and then optimize in it accordingly. And um, I love, I love this, this straightforward explanation you all have, you know, with your company, Apollo Neuro, about HRV. And I would love to kind of get your take on it. If we could just really dive into what is HRV and how does it serve us in terms of measuring and managing our stressors? HRV is the most reliable, non-invasive biometric of stress, measuring the balance between the parasympathetic and sympathetic systems. Break that down for us, please. What are these systems and what is HRV and how can we really truly understand it and apply it? Sure. So the first thing to note is that um, you want high heart rate variability, which a lot of people intuitively are like, no, I want low. Yeah, you want low resting heart rate. High score is good here. High score is good here, everybody. My score is good here. Um, what HRV is, heart rate variability, is the amount and the frequency with which your heart rate changes with the environment. So you want to be adaptable. So if, for instance, a bear showed up, you'd want your heart rate to go up and you'd want to get the heck away from the bear. But then once the bear is gone, you want your heart rate to go back to normal, right? So athletes, for instance, have higher HRV than regular folk because they train for it, right? Mm -hmm. They train to be able to respond to whatever it is, making a basket, tennis, whatever it is, they want to be able to respond to the thing that's coming to them. But then after the exercise, they want to be able to recover in between sets quickly, right? And so um, having low HRV means that you're less adaptable. Mm. So your heart rate may not go up as fast as it needs to, to respond to the stressor. It may not come down quickly enough. And so you're basically having lower HRV is just a sign that you're strained Mm. and that could be for any host of things, right? So uh, a low HRV could be because you're chronically stressed out, could be because you're uh, didn't sleep well, right? Having poor sleep or poor sleep quality is a big indicator of HRV. I'm hearing really. sleep a lot. And what do you have to say? So uh, pay attention, everybody sleep. There's a common thread here. It's important very thing. important. Um, and then it's also just making sure that there is some strain, right? So if you don't do, if you don't have eustress, if you don't have exercise or strain or like cognitive activities, you also will have lower HRV. So it's really about um, a marker of the balance of your nervous system. So you asked about the parasympathetic and the sympathetic mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. The parasympathetic, the nervous system has two main branches. Sympathetic is fight or flight. It's the part of your nervous system that responds to threat. It's what sends the blood to your muscles and your extremities when you're under stress. It's what makes your heart rate go fast. It's what makes you start to sweat. And it's a really important part of the nervous system because it's supposed to be able to protect you from threat. It's so that you know how to, your body knows how to respond when it's under threat. It's that the throttle. Parent- it's, it's, do I need to floor it or do I need to right. let off the gas? Yeah. Do I need to f- flee? Do I need to fight? Do I need to freeze? Mm-hmm. Like what needs to happen? The parasympathetic is all the stuff that goes on in the background when things are okay. Right. So it's your it's your sleep. It's your breath rate under normal circumstances, your heart rate under normal circumstances. And basically, when you get chronically stressed out, so somebody who isn't sleeping well, has a lot of strain in their life, maybe is over exercising, whatever it is, is too strained and doesn't have enough recovery. What you'll see is that the body will favor sympathetic activity. So what that means is your body (laughs) 
as with anything, practice makes perfect. Mm. So if you practice being stressed out and not recovered, your body will remember how to do that well. <laughs> unfortunately, and so, unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. whatever you practice, your body knows how to do. So if you practice being stressed out, whether that's being tired or working out too much or working too hard, whatever it is, and not giving yourself that time to recover, you'll have more sympathetic activity. And one of the markers to show you that you're in a sympathetic state and not a parasympathetic recovered state is that you will have a lower heart rate variability, meaning that your body is less adaptable to stress. You're less resilient to it. And in the short term, having lower HRV one day is just an indicator that, oh, I didn't sleep well and I really should pay attention to that. But if you've chronically lower HRV, it's a sign that you're pretty consistently strained, which makes you more susceptible to getting sick. Like you're more likely to get a cold, right? You're more likely to get run down. You're also, if you're an athlete, more likely to get injured. And so having lower HRV and is an indicator that you need to pay attention to what your body's telling you, which is that you need more recovery time so that you can continue to perform. I've also been finding in a lot of new HRV studies and just looking you know, at correlations that longevity and HRV have a very tight bond. We're looking at a lot of people that are living 80s, 90s, even centenarians, 100 and above. Commonality we're finding now is, now that we know what HRV is and we're actually studying it that long, is these people have high HRVs. So a consistently high HRV we're finding is really neck and neck with longevity and quality of life, which I know you talk about in your work as well, in the relationships and the quality of life and how that actually can affect our HRV. And I can personally share that that's absolutely true. One of my hacks when I share my HRV data and how I've gotten it to go from like 50s, 60s to 130s, 140s, even 150s and above in about a year is I, I've mentioned and told people I focus on my downtime. I focus on spending quality time with the people that matter to me, deepening new and nurturing quality relationships. That sounds a little foreign. It, it, you know, we're not training, we're not sleeping. You mean to tell me if I just spend time with people, it's gonna be good for my health? Walk us mm -hmm. through relationships in HRV, please. Sure. So uh, human connection is one of the core sources of our happiness, right? So you can be a really strong athlete who has perfect sleep and, you know, gets all these things down to a science. But if you're really lonely mm. and you don't have meaningful relationships, um, you feel hollow. Um, I don't know if you know Dr. Joe Maroon, if you're familiar with his work. No. Um, Dr. Maroon is a neurosurgeon. Um, he's a Heindel scholar um, and was the head of neurosurgery at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center for many years um, and was the neurosurgeon for the Steelers for like, oh, I think 40 years, wow, something to that wow. effect. Um, but he wrote a book called Square One, um, which is actually about his own burnout. And it has uh, four points, right? Which is like your physical health and your, your spiritual health, your work and your personal relationships. And he's like, draw your square. And if your square is not even, figure out where it's not even, and that's where you need to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And spiritual life could be whatever it is, right? It could be meditation or quiet time or your hike, whatever it is, however you find it, whether it's religious or not, it's this family and human connection and friendships, your work and the meaning you derive from your work, your physical activity, right? Um, and, and this is how you, how you build this square, um, in order to basically figure out where is, where is the gap? It's and not just so, doing for the sake of doing, it's doing with meaning. I heard you say, and finding joy and fulfillment out of it, I'm sure. And being able to look back, just like we do a lot of times with, that was a great workout. Or, that was a great night's sleep. That was quality time spent. That should be a great, another way to check in. Yeah. And all of those things are about, right. Your spiritual, mm -hmm. the physical, the work and the connections with other people is all about why, like, why are you here? What are you focused on? What are you deriving meaning from? What brings joy to you, right? Like, I don't even like the word work. <laughs> Call it that. Like, it's just non joy. To, oh, I shouldn't even say that. It sounds negative. Yeah. yeah I mean, I love my work. I get to yeah. derive a lot of meaning from my work. It makes me happy. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, uh, you know, that I think that uh, Joe Square, and I've seen other 
versions of this, but that square is really helpful because it's about balance, Mm -hmm. physical, the spiritual, the mental, and the connection to others. Now, I understand that your interest and your work around stress, HRV, et cetera, all the things we've been talking about thus far, it doesn't just end with understanding. It actually, you've taken a step further and with Apollo Neuro. So I'm really curious to know where did this start and how is this device able to do these wonderful things? How is it able to actually help us manage and improve stress, HRV, et cetera? Sure. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Apollo Neuro is a wearable device uh, that uses low frequency sound waves to actually change the balance of the nervous system. So unlike Mm -hmm. other wearables that track, tell you your HRV is low, you didn't sleep well, Apollo takes it a step further, it actually is an intervention. Um, and it delivers these low frequency sound waves. So it's basically music designed for your skin instead of for your ears. Interesting. Uh, that helps the body transition into different states, whether that's a wakeful focus state, kind of like a zone flow state, a meditative state, a relaxed state, and a sleeping state. And uh, a lot of our users use it to help balance their circadian rhythms between wake and sleep cycles. Um, and where it came from was... Uh, my co-founder and uh, who's lucky for me, my better half um, is a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist. And he has been studying chronic stress um, and its effects on the body for 15 plus years now. Mm, Um, And he was down at the university of Pittsburgh, uh, primarily working on interventions for people with chronic uh, and treatment resistant post-traumatic stress disorder. So uh, a lot of folks um, who are essentially looking to find ways to manage their PTSD symptoms um, with or without medication, but in many instances, medication hadn't worked, right? And um, David was looking at, David Raven, my co-founder and my husband, was looking at uh, ways to intervene in the stress response because ultimately uh, what folks were being told to do and what was working in the clinic but was really challenging for people to do at home was all the things that wellness tells you to do, right? Meditate, do biofeedback, do breath work, right? Like all of these different behavioral therapies and uh, and mindfulness practices. Um, but the challenge was that folks were doing well in the clinic. And then as soon as they went home, it was really hard to maintain the practice. And we no, can kind of all relate to this, right? Mm-hmm. Like learning to meditate is hard if you're a relatively healthy person. Because if you don't grow up learning this practice and you show up to it, and you're 25 years old or older, you have to learn a whole new skill set that you were never taught. And learning things is actually harder when you're stressed out. So I was going to say, and like, also doesn't learning things like this and it's so new and difficult, it's, isn't it just also giving us new stress? Yes, it's giving you new stress. And so basically what would have, what Dave said was, well, why are we setting people up for failure? Why are we making them more frustrated, right? They're already stressed out. And then we give them something that they have a really hard time learning how to do. And then they fail at it, which I mean, I'm still trying to learn how to meditate, right? I've been Same. at this for like <laughs> yeah. 10 years, yeah. right? It's hard. And so why are we setting people up to fail at something and then get frustrated at themselves and then they shut down, right? And so Dave was like, okay, well, how do we, what do you need in order to sleep well, to have control over your emotions, to have control over your stress response? What do you need? You need recovery and you need to feel safe. Your body needs to feel safe to sleep. It needs to feel safe to meditate. It needs to feel safe in order to enter a, uh, a vulnerable position, right? And meditate. what do you mean exactly by, by safe? Can you expand on that, please? Is it just I know that I have a roof over my head or is it certain basic no, human needs? Is it, no. is it temperature? So, what is it? No. So basically when I'm going back to sympathetic and parasympathetic, if you chronically stress your body out, mm. so this could be because you've had a traumatic experience and you, your body is over is sensitized, right? So somebody with PTSD, somebody who's experienced tr- something traumatic and has a pr- traumatic res- you know, stress response disorder or not, mm-hmm. or just somebody who's really chronically stressed out right? Like you're burning the candle at both ends. You're not sleeping well. You don't have high risk. You're not resilient anymore because you're burnt out. 
And this could be anywhere along the spectrum. It could be somebody who's healthy, who's just really strained all the way to somebody who's dealing with a condition that's worsened by stress, right? Um, so when you're in that state, your body, the sympathetic, the fight or flight system is overactive. And that is what I mean by safety. Your body doesn't think it's safe. So for instance, just an example, you're not sleeping well because you have some big presentation the next day. Your body thinks, <laughs> your body thinks I can't go to sleep because there's an evolutionary pathway in there that goes, there's a threat. There's a bear outside the den. I can't go to bed because there's a bear outside the den. Until that has been overcome and that's been checked off visually and then I, I can't deal. But right, but there is no bear. It's something that's not actually threatening, but your body doesn't know that, right? The amount of things that have evolved over the last hundred years is insane, right? For the huge, like our bodies have not caught up to the environmental changes that we produced, right? Even if you think about, I think they said the amount of information that someone uh, picks up, the average person in America picks up in the first 15 minutes of being awake is more information that that a person in the 1950s picked up in the in an entire week. I believe it. I believe it. That's why that people don't wake up and pick up your phone. Right? No, no, um, do not put your phone in your bedroom. Yeah, Worst thing. I, you, I heard this analogy. Um, I think it was Jay Shetty, this beautiful way of describing that. If you're waking up and you're rolling over and opening up your phone and checking messages, scrolling social media, that's the digital version of this real life version of if you just woke up and invited 50, 100, 10,000 people into your bedroom, would no. that not be extremely overwhelming? But yet we choose to do it because it's in this small little container right here called a smartphone. It, it's wild. That, that analogy just completely sealed the deal for me of, yeah, I'm glad I'm not doing that. I'm keeping it on airplane mode until another 30 minutes, another hour. Yep. Precisely. But so the, when I say, think about when what I mean safety is that your nervous system is overactive, right? Mm -hmm. So Dave was working specifically with these patients with PTSD and he's like, how do I get the body to feel safe? How do I signal recovery to the body? How do I get the body to calm down? So rather than a top down approach, you need to learn to meditate. You need to focus on the screen and do biofeedback. You need to learn this breathwork exercise. Mm -hmm. It's actually even harder to do in the moment that you're stressed out, because when you're actually stressed out, your body goes into fight or flight and you forget all the things you're supposed to do in order to feel better. And so he's like, how do I bottom up signal safety to the body and then give you that opportunity for a moment of pause? And then as a result, you have more cognitive control. You have more uh, control over your attention and your focus. You're able to perform better. You're able to fall asleep. Right. And so Dave mapped out. And then there are all these different ways to do that, right? We know that light and music, right? All of these different things affect your nervous system. If you've ever walked into a soothing room, right? With like the nice lighting and the nice music, you feel better, mm -hmm. right? You feel mm -hmm. calm nearly instantly. And so we know that the sensory environment has a huge impact, but the challenge is you can't always be listening to music. You can't always be doing biofeedback. You can't always be in a perfect environment. Sometimes you're in like a horrible fluorescently lit, like, crazy place. And so Dave was like, well, what's always with you that doesn't require your eyes and your ears? What can you use when your kids are screaming in the back of the car or you're late or you're trying to find a parking spot or whatever it is, you have a presentation, you have a thousand meetings, whatever it is that's got you, how can you have something with you that helps your support your body's recovery in the moment that you're stressed out? And or in just to support your recovery throughout the day that doesn't require you to leave your day to day life to do yet another thing. And so we mapped out the sensory pathway in the body and found that certain frequencies of sound, hmm. when applied to the skin, can actually signal safety to your nervous system. And as a result, wow. it can help bring down your heart rate, can improve your heart rate variability, and can give you more control. And so that's where it came from. Um, and this was all at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and uh, University of Pittsburgh. Um, and we did several clinical trials there because um, we never were actually trying to start a company. What we were trying to do was develop a new tool. Um, and As then, all best inventions are, is solving, yeah. solving a problem first and then like 
shit, we got something. <laughs> and that's precisely yeah. what happened is that we did this clinical work and we found that Apollo in healthy people was improving cognitive performance under stress, was helping people meditate, was helping athletes recover more quickly from strain. And that was really compelling. And, you know, my job is technology transfer. It's how to translate things from lab discoveries from R and D and actually get them to market. And I looked at it and was like, this is going to help a whole heck of a lot of people. This applies to pretty much anybody alive Mm -hmm. who has stress. And so, um, you know, what we found that's really interesting is that it isn't just a momentary tool is that if you use Apollo consistently, so we use it during the day and at night. We did a uh, about a year long study with uh, in our first cohort about a little over 500 people who also wear an aura ring, and we tracked their biometrics yeah, yeah. over time. And we found that the people who used Apollo, so there we had a baseline data of about six months of baseline uh, biometric data, and then watched how that changed as a result of their usage of Apollo. We found is that the people who used Apollo consistently, so they're using it about an hour and a half during the day and about an hour and a half at night. So like three hours total, five days a week had these enormous changes. So it's not a consistent tool. It's a thing you put on when you're in a stress state, you don't just keep it on and it's triggered. Originally we were like, people will wear this when they're stressed. Hmm. And then what we found was that actually when you looked at this year long data is that people, and this isn't a healthy population, just regular users, What we found is that people who used Apollo consistently, so they're using it like for focus during the day or for, uh, you know, socializing during the day. And then they use it at night to help them unwind and go to sleep. What we saw is reduced caffeine usage, reduced alcohol consumption, and big changes in biometrics, like an average 19% improvement in their deep sleep. Wow. 14% improvement in REM. So basically your sleep, the light sleep is getting change to deep and REM Amazing. and that HRV was going up to like an average of 12% across the population. And so what we're showing is that when you're using this tool, it's helping your body recover and it's helping to retrain the nervous system to not be in a sympathetic fight or flight state anymore, but to be in a more recovered state. So it's supporting your body's recovery in the way that a meditation practice would, or a breath work practice would, but it's passive. And so it's a tool in the toolbox to really help you get better sleep, get more deep sleep and REM sleep, which is super important for mm-hmm. recovery, HRV, memory consolidation, cognitive performance, and that you're going into your day more recovered. And so you have more ability to focus and control your attention, which is our most important resource, Truly, really. Yeah. It, it kind of, it begs the question for me of a little bit of, I guess, devil's advocate. Mm-hmm. There's this tool like many other tools that we can have and that we use in our wellness journey, our day-to-day productivity to help make a certain task more enjoyable or to change the experience physiologically like we're talking about here. Um, but what about the mental component we're talking about before of the, the perception of it? Mm-hmm. Is the tool something that can help us get to a better level of perception to have a better mindset when it comes to stressors or is it, you know, a Band-Aid? So what was really interesting about that is that there's this double learning that's going on. So, and it's interesting watching people's use of the Apollo, the Apollo wearable change over time. So in the beginning, for instance, my own example, I started using Apollo. Um, I'm like one of the first users, right? I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. I did a performance trial yeah. and we found that people under stress were getting more questions right. Their HRV was going up when we were stressing them out in a cognitive performance task. And I was like, okay, well, I run a startup. I got a lot to do. I'll start using it on the focus mode. And so I was using it on focus mode. And what was really interesting, the very beginning, so I didn't use it for sleep yet. We hadn't done the sleep study yet. I'm very data oriented. And so, and I'm from New York better or for worse, I'm really skeptical. (laughs) And so I was like, well, there's data on focus. I'll use it for focus. Uh Using it for focus and what's really interesting is yes, it did help drop me in, right? Like I noticed that I dropped in, that I entered a flow state with my work more quickly. And that was really interesting to me. Because it was kind of like, I had put on like my favorite playlist. You know, when you drop in, you're listening to like a really good playlist oh, doing your work. Shout out like, Brain Food on Spotify. That thing just yeah. gets me in the flow. Yeah. Or like I love that one too. Or House Focus. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And so that was kind of what was happening. And it also amplified that when I was using music as well, it made it even better, right? Like, and so my productivity went up, but what was also really interesting is I noticed when I went off task more quickly when I had the Apollo on. Really? Wow. Because like, my attention deviated and I felt this and I was like, hey, you had the intention of doing this and you were attending to something all other than that. You were able to pull back to center. Off go back to center. That's what you said you were going to do. And so it was like a commitment device, like a reminder. Interesting. A reminder to the promise you made for yourself consciously right. or subconsciously of the task before you. Yes. Because you said focus mode and you put that on because you wanted to go do X, Y, Z. Mm. So why are you looking at that email? That's not X, Y, Z. You need to go finish the thing you said you were going to go do. Wow. And it was really interesting as a reminder. And then what was, what naturally evolved was I I run a startup. So I had to start traveling all the time. So I'm in different time zones and I need to pop off the plane and I need to go to a meeting and I need to be fresh and ready to present and on top of my game. And, you know, I might've gotten like not as much sleep as I needed to. And I don't want to go drink a big cup of coffee. And so I started using Apollo on social mode for meetings and presentations, which gave me a little bit more energy and I didn't drink a coffee. And as a result, I'm not drinking coffee, so I'm not overstimulated. So my sleep cycle is more normal. Yeah, keeping and I that used, circadian rhythm more in check. Yeah. Yep. And I used my Apollo for sleeping on the plane and for falling asleep in the new time zone. So I would actually fall asleep more easily. And it really did help me with maintaining my HRV, being recovered, staying on top of my game, not relying on as many stimulants. Hmm. And so it it was an interesting evolution of my own usage as I incorporated different elements of it into my own life, as we were discovering with our studies, how things changed for people as a result of their usage. You know, for me, being a health and fitness guy at my core, um, it, this analogy comes up for me of, for many of us, when we start our physical fitness journey, our health journey, we, we typically start with the external self, right? We, we start running, we go work out. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine, you know, it's kind of like, all right, I'm making this commitment to myself to better my health for whatever my goal is. I'm going to hire a trainer. I'm going to hire a coach. And it's these training wheels we put on at the time to help us have more awareness and develop a better perspective with this process. Odds are you're not going to keep or I would say need at the same frequency or intensity, that same coach, that same trainer in six months, in a year, five years down the road. So it kind of gives me this picture of we're now able to put on training wheels for stress management, for productivity management, and reminding ourselves, which as you were describing, it was beautiful, of the promises we make to ourselves and the promises we break to ourselves mm -hmm. all the time when we veer off track of what we said we were gonna do, and more importantly, how we wanna feel during. It, it's, it's about the here and the now of I wanna accomplish this task and I wanna do what I say I'm gonna do, but to your point of when we travel, when we get in different time zones, when we have all these different tasks, when stressors, when life happens, it's also about the future self. And what sacrifice are we making here and now that the future self is gonna to have to pay for? Yeah, and I think the other part is just giving yourself a little bit of a break. Grace, like, yeah, grace. Like, you know, like we're not perfect. You can have all these intentions and then life happens. And so, you know, Apollo, you know, as a brand, you know, it's really about like, okay, well, your sleep was real rough. And that may be because you have a newborn, mm -hmm, right? Or mm -hmm. you're really stressed out, or you had to travel and now you're in some weird time zone. Your brain has no idea what's going on. Like, okay, life happened. How do we then support your recovery so that you can get back to what you were trying to do, mm -hmm. right? How do we bring you back to baseline? Because the thing is, this isn't a replacement for meditation or for breath work or for exercise, right? It's not like all of those things are critical for your health. Apollo is there to help support you and make those things easier. Like we did a, a pilot study at the University of Pittsburgh where we showed that people who were novice meditators, people who had no experience meditating, when they use the Apollo, their brainwave states caught up to those of meditators within about 12 minutes. Wow. And wow. so they started to look like that. And so why is that? Because somebody who is an experienced meditator knows how to enter a meditative state. They know how to get their body there. But if you don't know that 
and you're just learning, then what ends up happening is you start having negative intrusive thoughts and your brain starts to race and then you start to judge the thoughts, right? It's not just observe the thought, let the thought go. There's a million different kinds of meditation. And then it's like, screw meditation. This is dumb. This isn't working. I can't deal with this. Like, I don't need to be thinking about my thoughts anymore. (laughs) And then you miss the whole point and you give up. And so, you know, Paulo, just like, you know, you really want to attend to this task and focus on what you need to work on, but you're really distracted and have a thousand things going on. And then you didn't accomplish it and then you feel bad about it. So Paulo is really about supporting you to recover so that you can do and pay attention to what you want to pay attention to, get the sleep that you want without having to rely on things that are outside yourself. Because ultimately, Apollo is just using sound to stimulate your own sense of touch right? It's something innate in us anyway. Wow. It's what you would get from someone giving you a hug or holding your hand or getting a massage, Stepping right? Stepping out into nature. Being out in nature, going and taking a walk, right? But you can't, we live in a modern society. Not everyone has access to, you know, beautiful nature trails every day, right? Some of us live in more urban environments. Apollo is there to kind of help undo some of the things that modernity does to us. Mm little bit more human and more connected with ourselves fascinating fascinating well i can't wait to dive into it myself um this has just been on my radar for quite some time and i'm really really interested in the data the quantitative aspect of it all but then just really to kind of just see how i feel uh recovery sleep hrv all things really recovery for me and my personal wellness journey and you know professional self productivity awareness mindfulness relationships everything has just really when i've been focusing more on that and how do i make that better or even sometimes just how do i just keep it consistent um has transcended and just cascaded really into every other area of my life so this is really really fascinating stuff thank you Catherine. oh thanks so much for having me uh well this is definitely bringing awareness to a very important area of our life to hopefully propel us forward and that's what we're all about here at ever forward radio is to learn ways to move forward in life to live a life ever forward but i'm curious what does that mean to you when you hear those two words ever forward yeah what does ever forward mean to you yeah i mean i uh, it means it it's kind of my whole life motto <laughs> Same. Same. <laughs> you know, so uh, ever forward is like ever learning, ever growing, um, ever expanding um, and not limiting oneself. Right. Not creating confines in my own mind around what I can accomplish, because ultimately your mind, you I really believe that if you set a goal and you set an intention and you baby step your way there, you will get there. And so for me, it's just making sure that there's enough capacity that I am supporting myself and supporting my community enough and even my team enough that we can go get the goal. Because ultimately, as long as you support yourself with enough resources and you have that intention and purpose, you get where you're going. And uh, anything we can do along the way to bring us back to center of that intention, of that promise we made to ourselves. I'm all for. So uh, again, just want to thank you for coming on. want to honor you and your work there at Apollo Neuro. Everything we've been talking about, everybody will have linked for you down in the show notes and the video notes here. Um, and this was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It was great.